Hello. So we are probably about four or five videos into the van conversion series by this point, and I've realized I still haven't actually shown you the final design. And so in this video, we're going to be doing just that. But not only that, I want to talk about some of the hurdles I faced while producing this design and more importantly, how I overcame them. Now, if you're watching this prior to designing your own van, awesome. That's what I'm here to help you with. But I will give you a recommendation on this resource, which is the Van Conversion Bible. This sort of gave me 90% of the knowledge I needed to get started. What I'm hoping to give you in this video is the extra five or 10% on top of that. I got a few extra tips and tricks and things that I've gained from my furniture making background, as well as a few things I've already learned the hard way during the design process. Another disclaimer, I haven't actually built the van yet. And so there may be errors in this design that I'll inevitably find out throughout the build. And so at the end of this series, I'm gonna do a summary review video, I guess, on the build to talk about all of those changes. And thirdly, if that's the third point, I can't remember, I'm not gonna be including any schematics in this video for the gas, electric and water because I am not qualified nor knowledgeable nor experienced enough to give even an opinion on those things. And so all I'm gonna be doing is maybe recommending the products I plan on using and things like that. So stick around, have a look in the description at the book and um, yeah, uh, take my words with a pinch of salt. <laughs> So here is the van in its entirety, and it's taken a long time to get to this point. This document is a graveyard for old models, some of which I spent two or three days working on and now sit there redundant, completely useless, a reminder of the effort and energy I put into those bastards. So there's a few things that you'll spot right away. A bed, a wet room, a kitchen, and a seating area. Standard van conversion right? Not quite. There is a ton of extra features and considerations that went into this thing that we'll obviously uncover throughout the video. Now I'm modeling this on SketchUp, which is a quick, relatively simple and free piece of modeling software. There is a bit of a learning curve to using it, but fortunately for you, if you want to learn it, I've got a tutorial up here that I posted on my free online woodworking school. I can't remember if it's five parts or 10 parts. It's been a while since I've even looked at the thing, but it's there if you want to use it, if you want to learn the program. Have a look at that. I use it all the time from things like furniture making all the way to like planning out a room before I start shifting pieces of furniture around. When logging dimensions of the van interior, the amount of measurements you take is really up to you. You could go relatively simple, leaving you with something like this to build your interior within, or you could go completely overboard like I did and log every roof rib, every supporting structure, and maybe even take a 3D scan of the interior so you can be as prepared as possible when designing. I mean, look, the wall ribs on my model are simple lines, but they give me enough information to figure out whereabouts I can place windows in relation to the internal furniture. Now, of course, it does get to a point of diminishing returns when you're taking these measurements. Yet when you're designing the interior, the last thing you want to be doing is going from your computer where you're designing it back to the van to quickly check something that wasn't on your measurements or like this weird thing that you can't quite remember what you logged. It just makes the process a lot slower and frustrating, which in my case was where having a 3D render of the interior was incredibly useful. To produce this scan, I used Polycam 3D and I used it so many times throughout the design process, I cannot vouch for it enough. I used it at times when I needed to remind myself what this weird thing was that I drew in the SketchUp model behind my seats. I could go to the 3D scan and remind myself, ah yes, it's that seatbelt column. Or alternatively, figuring out how I could get a wire trailing up to above the bed area. The scan allowed me to remind myself of the hollow cavity running up the back of the van where the brake lights are without needing to run outside and go and check myself. So yeah, taking a 3D scan, really useful. I'm pretty sure the software's free. I'd recommend it. Now my van is going to be used primarily for full-time van life, which means it needs to have considerations for sleeping, cooking, pooping, showering, sleeping, did I say sleeping, working, uh, and sitting, driving. I need to be able to drive the thing whatever. And normally to fit all of these functions into such a small space, van conversions are generally designed to be modular. That's to say like a bed can turn into a dining table or a chair can turn into a bouncy castle. I, I don't know. Th things are made to be able to be changed relatively quickly and easily. However, this is me we're talking about and I'm self-aware enough to know that I am a very, very lazy individual. And so there is not a chance that someone like me should be given a bed that turns into a dining table. I will either end up eating in bed every night or I'll end up sleeping on a dining table, whichever one I happen to get comfortable with first, probably eating in bed because I kind of already do it. So for this reason, modularity would only be included 
included for bonus features of the van. It would not be for any of the essential things like eating, sleeping, cooking, pooping, showering, driving, and all those other things. That was good, that was quite quick. For example, if on the rare occasion I've got a mate who stays with me, or on the more frequent occasion I eat too much fiber in a day and my girlfriend kicks my smelly ass out of bed, I have got the option to add a second bed to the van. And so you'll see how that's constructed later in the video, but yeah, modularity only for bonus features, none of the essentials. Shut up. Stop calibrating. Thank you. Uh. Starting with the bed. This bed is oriented widthways in the van, which as a six foot one tall individual is quite a questionable move because it's very hard to sleep widthways in a van that is only six foot wide. I did consider installing flares to create extra width, but had issues with sourcing them, and I even considered making my own. But in the interest of time and the fact that I'm actually a side sleeper and I tend to like curl up like a ball when I sleep, I figured I could get away with it and so didn't bother. It's constructed from aluminium extrusion, which makes it very lightweight, rigid, and is also removable. Should I ever need to transport anything big in the van temporarily, I could just take out the bed, bung something in there, and then move something, whatever. This bed frame is attached to aluminium brackets, which will be attached to the walls with rivet nuts. Now using this method of attaching the bed to the walls leaves you with limited options as to what height you can actually place the bed. But fortunately, the only criteria I needed to meet was being able to fit my gravel bike underneath, which I could just about do. The bed has two reading lights with USB outlets, which can be used for charging phones at night. The switches that you see next to the bed will control two rows of LED lights. One row will be found in this alcove to act as some nice mood lighting. And the second row will be on the underside of these cabinets to kind of further fill out the space. Of course, they're going to be RGB LEDs, so I can change the color and brightness and all that stuff. It should be pretty cool. Now, obviously, LED strips and reading lights aren't the strongest light sources. They'll be, they'll be nice and ambient, but it won't really fill out the space should I want to brighten it up for whatever reason. And so at either end of the bed, there'll be a window, and then above it, I've got a MaxFan Deluxe being installed. But it's not just there to act as a skylight. There will be other uses for it, which I'll talk about later in this video. There's also a 230 volt socket at the base of the bed. Spoiler for what's going to be included in my electric system. There's also a step that makes it easier to climb into the bed with a lid that can be lifted so I can have a container for my laundry that can both be removed from the front of the van by lifting up the step or from the back via the garage area. Speaking of clothing, on one side of the step is a wardrobe that will store all three of the t-shirts that I wear on a day-to-day -day basis, which if you're interested can be purchased from mattesley.com forward slash shop. Please check it out if you want to support my channel. And on the other side of the step is the wet room, which consists of a toilet and a shower. Now I'm considering making a bespoke shower tray and toilet from fiberglass to really maximize this space rather than just work with thick products like a pre-sized shower tray and then I don't know I'd have to make a toilet around that whatever. I'm tempted to try and make a fiberglass thing that all flows into one and just makes it easier to drain water, clean, you know all those kind of things but we'll see. The shower itself will be a rainfall shower that I'm planning on making from copper pipes, an idea that I got from this tiny house video. Two of the walls will be stone effect vinyl with the third one behind the toilet being a mirror. I got this idea from Van Life Builds as I noticed how much spacier it makes the small room look. Now the mirror is only on one wall as I didn't want to create a infinite mirror effect and it's specifically on this wall so then I don't have to watch myself poop while I poop. And to help with ventilation, there'll be a small skylight added above the shower. Now using the example of me eating too much fiber in one day, let's assume that one day I drop a bunch of hazardous waste into the, um, into the compost toilet. The last thing I want to do is have to pick up and carry that thing through the kitchen area and permeate the whole thing with... yeah. Maybe not. A much better alternative would be the ability to be able to empty it from the back of the van through the garage in the same way that the laundry is. So not only does this step contain the laundry basket, but I'll also make an access hatch into the underside of the toilet that allows the, the, the bucket to be removed too. Not only will I make sure that this seal is very airtight, but there will be an inbuilt fan in the toilet. And so there's no buildup of, uh, of fumes, should we say. And now moving around, we've got the kitchen. Now, I don't know about you, but there is little that annoys me more than having limited counter space in a kitchen. It just, it fucks with me. And so not only have I been generous with this work area, but I've put a sink into a separate unit that keeps all the clean stuff away from the dirty stuff, while also having the added benefit of being able to swivel the tap 180 degrees and have water access from the outside of the van. It also means that all the water services are on one side of the van, with exception to the water heater, which we'll talk about in a minute. To the side of it is a vertical drying rack that I haven't seen anywhere else, and I, I'm not gonna say it's an original idea. I mean, it was, but I, 
I haven't seen it before. And this little flap on the bottom is on a hinge to allow it to be folded away or folded out to redirect dripping water back into the sink. Additionally, we've got a drinking water tap that will be fed from a water bottle and submergible pump stored in this area, which is an idea I got from Greg Virgo. The kitchen itself includes a Thetford triplex hop, I think I'm saying that right, which has a three burner hob, a grill and an oven, all powered by LPG. Next to it is a Vitra free, vi Vitra, vi the, the, Vitra fri Vitra Frigo, free, it's on the screen. <laughs> I got a fridge there which is on the larger side for van conversions, but like counter space, having limited fridge space really bugs me. Mainly because I hate how disorganized small fridges can be. You've got to like nest things in and then if you want something from the bottom, you pull it out and everything falls down. Like just having a bigger space allows me to be a little bit more willy nilly about where I place things and it's just going to be better. We've also got a series of drawers to the right hand side of the cooker which will maybe store utensils and cutlery and things like that. We've got overhead storage for pots and pans and containers whatever. On the side we got a spice rack and then next to that a switch that controls two sets of LEDs one of which will go on the underside of the overhead cabinets and the other row will be at foot level along the base of the kitchen. The bottom row of LEDs is primarily for ambience but the top one is to light up the area so the LEDs behind me on the roof aren't casting shadows in front of me while I'm trying to chop something. We've also got two extra drawers on the left, the top one including a small compost bin for food scraps that can be filled through this removable plug on top, and the bottom one will include a general waste and recycling bin, which will again be on a sliding drawer mechanism. I wanted to keep everything on the lower half as drawers because there's nothing I hate more than having cupboards below waist height. You, like Things just get chucked in there, it's so difficult to organise. For me, having everything in drawers below waist level is just easier to keep organised and easier to keep clean. And then underneath the oven is where my heater and water boiler is going to be. For this I'm going to be using the Truma 4E which is very popular in the van conversion world. This has four outlets that vent hot air to various points around the van, one of which will be at the back doors to heat up the bed area, another one will be in the wet room to help with drying wet clothes and towels and whatever I hang up in there, and the remaining two head towards the front of the van out of these two vents and may even have a Y junction going out to where the handbrake is to warm up the driver's cab. Which brings us on to the next area. Area. This is the seating area in the van which doesn't look like much at first but a lot of thought went into it. Now you might be asking why is there a bench there when you've got two swivel seats like surely that bench could be used for more storage or something a bit more optimal. Well again this comes into the modularity aspect of the inside of the van. Seating is one of the essential functions I want and having swivel seats is technically a modular thing and that breaks my rule. I don't want to have to do something modular in order to have an essential. Let's say I'm parking up the van for like half an hour or so just because I want a break or something. If I want to have somewhere to sit, I don't want to have to get out the van, go into the back, swivel a seat, sit down for 15 minutes and then have to get up, spin the seats back around and then drive. I just want to be able to get out, sit. And so having a bench that's ready at all times is a must. But this bench does also have some bonus features about it. If in the future I decide to be sociable with more than two people at a time. Having an extra bench there will allow me to seat up to three people. Two on the swivel passenger seat, one on the bench. If I ever want to, God forbid, entertain more than that, the bench has a slide out drawer that with a little bit of rearranging of the pillows will allow me to seat a fourth person and if this is, I swear to God, if this ever happens, I'm terrified. I host up to five people in that space. The side of the sink unit is able to fold down and become a seat in itself. And then another cushion comes from the seating area and is able to sit on there. And you might look at this and also recognize, hey, that could be a bed. That's the bed. <laughs> that's, that's the second one. I feel like that was a real anti-climax. Anyway, the other cool thing about this whole setup is the driver's seat can also swivel and that means that the bench can be used as a footrest if I want to kind of like, you know, just sit there and recline and look out the driver's window. I don't know, it was just a happy accident. In this area is another set of sockets, one 230 volt socket which can be used for charging a laptop while I work or as a power point for an appliance should I want to power something like a blender in the kitchen, as well as a number of 12 volt USB sockets for small devices such as phones. I also added this mesh as a way of visually segmenting the different areas of the van without making it too harsh so it cuts out light and things. I tend to like it in van conversions when areas are clearly designated rather than it be completely open plan. I feel like living in a completely open plan, 
open plan van would sort of feel a little bit samey and you wouldn't get like the change of environment that you sometimes need from moving to a bedroom to a work area and stuff like that. And so having a boxed off bed area and having a kind of boxed off seating area was important to me. This area will be lit with four LED spotlights that will be surrounding another Max Van Deluxe, which will not only provide natural light to the area, which will also be provided by the windows on either side of the van, but the Max Van will have the added benefit of working in unison with the fan at the back of the van, so much rhyming to create airflow through the van. You can set these to be a intake or exhaust. And so if on a hot day, it's a bit stuffy in there, set the back one to intake, set the front one to exhaust and you get airflow through the van. It's also good for exhausting fumes from cooking and stuff like that. Over the swivel seats, I'll be removing the liner in favor of a more efficient storage solution for miscellaneous items that would normally be thrown in the attic of a home. Now, we've come this far without discussing materials, but you can't have a discussion about materials without also acknowledging weight. In the UK, if you passed your test after the 1st of January 1997, you will probably have a category B license. That license will cover you up to a three and a half ton payload. Now this three and a half ton payload includes the weight of the van itself, which in my case is, I think it's about 2.3 tons, which only leaves me with 1.2 tons or so to play with, which includes all of the materials I plan on installing all of the appliances, all of my personal belongings, me, all of my food that I plan on having in there, everything. 1.2 tons is a lot of weight, but if you're not careful, would be very easy to exceed, especially when not using the right material. And so if your vehicle exceeds the three and a half ton limit, you need to upgrade to a C1 license, which if you passed your test before the 1st of January, 1997, you might have. Obviously check your license to confirm this, but yeah, after the 1st of January 97, you got a category B license like me. If you passed before, you got a C1 license, which will cover you up to a higher payload. I can't remember exactly what it is. However, saying that for all of you, is it boomers? I can't, I'm so bad with generations. I barely, I think, yeah, boom, it might be a boomer. For all you boomers out there, that's, I think that's the weirdest address I've ever given. But anyway, even though you have that privilege, it's not one that you want to abuse. Exceeding three and a half tons will have massive knock-on effects for your van. Think of things like maneuverability, braking times, hill climbing, tire wear, all sorts of knock-on effects that are completely avoidable if you plan correctly. What I did to keep track of everything is create a spreadsheet that not only totals up the overall weight of everything I'm planning on putting into the van, but also gives me a way of assigning the load to either the left or right of the van to help with balancing. This was incredibly useful just for like quickly drafting up an idea on my SketchUp model and then referring to the spreadsheet and assigning the loads correctly and seeing where it ended up. Many of the models found in my graveyard have been discarded as a result of not working in this spreadsheet. The loads would have been completely off, the van would have been too heavy on one side and just had to be completely reworked. And so if you want to use this spreadsheet yourself, I've popped a link to it in the description. And so here is a list of the actual materials I plan on using. First, let's start with the floor. Some people used veneered plywood or solid tongue and groove boards for this, but I decided to use high quality vinyl. Easy to install, fully waterproof, and although not quite as durable as solid wood, should still be enough to suit my purposes. Next are the walls. Again, I've seen a lot of people use tongue and groove boards for the walls, which I will credit to them in saying it looks very nice, but the added weight that's being added is insane. A much better alternative that I've seen used elsewhere is hollow soffit boards. These provide the tongue and groove effect I was looking for while also being colored white, which will aid with bouncing light around the space and making it feel a bit larger. They've also got the added benefit of being made from recycled, recycled PVC, which makes them wipe clean and they've got a thin air gap in them, which I'm told helps with insulation. I'm not gonna preach as to what degree it helps, but I'm told it does. And so make of that what you will. But compared to solid wood, it's a no-brainer. Looking at the internal stud walls next, plywood is generally a very good option for this because of the cross-grain construction. It makes it very strong and less likely to warp. But the downside to plywood is that it is really, really heavy, especially when it's the 12 or 15 millimeter stuff I plan on using. For you Americans out there, that's half an inch or five eighths inch. And so after a little bit of searching, I came across this stuff. This is a foam core plywood, which is specifically designed for caravan and boat builders. Now, prior to this, I've never actually works with the stuff before but having got a sample from Latham's and done a few initial tests I am really really impressed by it and I, I didn't even use the stuff properly like if you want to join it on a corner you're meant to fill in the foam along here with a solid bit of wood and then use that to join 
I just dominoed straight into the foam, glued that together and was able to stand on it. And so when it comes to actually building the cabinetry and walls and stuff like that, and I do it properly, I am feeling very confident in this stuff. Now these stud walls have a 45 millimeter cavity to allow wires and cables and things to go between and may even be filled with extra insulation like rock wall to help with further insulating and isolating spaces in terms of thermal and sound insulation. I've got a little bit of figuring out with regards to the curves around the van and how I'm gonna construct those and join those to the cabinets because even in my furniture making background, I've never actually constructed cabinets with curved edges like that before. So that is gonna be a bit of a learning curve. <laughs> pun nice and so with all of this weight reduction i've given myself a lot of headroom in terms of weight but as a nod to those of you who are following me as a result of my furniture making background i will be using solid wood in small cases like drawer sides and some of the cabinetry and stuff and incorporating traditional construction like dovetailed drawers and all those sorts of things it's to give a nod to you guys and also uh, to look proficient in something while i'm building the van because inevitably in the rest of it i'm gonna look like an absolute idiot i can just be like right well at least i can make a draw now as i said at the start of the video i'm not going to be sharing schematics with you or anything but i will show you sorry oh Wow. I will show you what I plan on including. To power everything, I've got a 525 watt solar array, a DC to DC converter, and shore power. These will all feed into a Victron system, which is very expensive and over the top for a lot of people, but let me explain my reasoning for it. Even if full-time van living doesn't work out, I plan on having this thing for a very, very long time because it's such a useful asset to have. And so in regards to that alone, having longevity and reliability in the electrics is just important. But beyond that, I also recognize at some point in the future, I might want to sell this van and having a high spec electrical system is gonna be desirable to the type of person who is willing to pay the amount of money that I will sell this van for. Having a sort of cheaper, more budget setup, while it will work, it's just gonna not look as reliable to an untrained eye. But beyond selling it, let's say I use it for a number of years and then for whatever reason the van dies and it's just not economical to repair the thing and I need to strip everything out of it. Well, being able to strip out the electrics of a Victron system will be incredible for powering a sort of off-grid system for a house or maybe a workshop. I don't expect it to be able to power the whole thing, but let's be fair, energy bills and stuff these days are bad enough. What are they gonna be like in 10 years? Having a little solar array might be helpful. And so for all of those reasons, that is why I'm choosing to splash out. It's what I tend to do with furniture making. I just tend to buy the best that I can afford so I don't have any issues later. Now I recognize that a Victron system isn't within everyone's budget. It is very expensive, but at the very least, what I'd recommend you do, let me grab it, is download this from the Victron website. This is Wiring Unlimited. It's a free document and it basically explains everything you need to know about using an off-grid system. And while the information in that document is often centric to Victron products, the language it uses is broad enough like inverters and split relay charge. Is that the one? DC to DC? I can't remember. <laughs> it uses broad enough language that you could apply to basically anything. And so when you're planning out your electric system and like me, you're not very confident with electrics, read that thing cover to cover. It will explain a lot. And then maybe check out a few extra videos on YouTube. I'll put a link to uh, another video by Greg Virgo below that I have probably watched about 25 times by this point. He's got some really good breakdowns of everything you need to know. But if you want to go a little bit more bespoke and specific, that's where this guide can help. Moving on to the water next, I've got a 100 litre water tank above the rear wheel arch. Now, the reason I chose to have this installed in the van is because I have this idea at some point that I want to drive to the Alps and do like a ski season or something. And having a water tank stored externally on the van makes it open to freezing, thus completely cutting off my water supply. And so moving it internally was the solution. Fun fact, I originally had this on the right hand side of the van so I could run water through the heater and then across to the shower and sink. But upon putting this into my weight distribution spreadsheet, I found this made the right hand side of the van grossly overweight because in addition to all of the appliances and kitchen stuff on that side of the van, 100 litres of water equals 100 kilograms of weight. Like the right hand side was so heavy compared to the left. And so for this reason, I shifted it across to the left to help kind of counterbalance the van a bit. The main downside to this is that although all of the water services are on the left hand side of the van, I do still need to feed the water across to the heater and then back in order to provide hot water to the shower and sink. So many of the iterations in this graveyard were centric around me trying to solve this problem, but I just I couldn't do it. I spent hours, if not days, just on this one problem and I just couldn't do it. This is all I came up with. Moving on to the gas next, I'll be carrying LPG in an underslung gas tank. 
There's a couple of reasons for this. The first one, it saves more space inside the van. And the second one being that when I'm topping it up, if there is a leak that occurs while I connect and disconnect the, uh, the valve, it's all happening externally. None of the leak will find its way inside the van. And so I only have two appliances that require gas, the oven and the water boiler, which as you've seen can both be found within the same area of the van, in addition to the manifold that splits and isolates the supply. So should the worst happen and a leak occurs, it's all happening in one area. It should be very easy to identify. And if it does occur, as per the UK regulations for LPG in motorhomes and caravans and stuff, there's gonna be a dropout vent in the floor. Now there's a few other things that you need to be aware of when it comes to these regulations. And so once again, I recommend Greg Virgo's video, link in the description. He's actually gone out there and taken the hit for the rest of us. And I can't believe they're even behind a paywall, but you need to buy the standards in order to follow the standards. It's completely stupid, but he's gone out there and bought the standards and is sharing it with the rest of us for free so we can all benefit from it. And honestly, even if you're not in the UK and you don't need to follow UK regulations, health and safety, while it's completely over the top and unnecessary for so many things, when it comes to LPG and poisonable and explodable gases, it's probably not something you want to be fucking around with. And so if you're in the US or Europe or Australia or elsewhere, you can be pretty certain that if you follow all the information in Greg's video, you're going to be safe. Now, that was a lot of information. And if you're sat there envying people like myself who have somehow figured it all out and got their van planned, I get it. It is such an overwhelming and difficult process to take on. It, like definitely the most difficult thing I've ever had to work out. And honestly, I'm, I'm still not confident in what I have. I haven't actually built the thing yet. It's not easy. And so it's okay to feel overwhelmed at this point. And not only might you feel overwhelmed by this process, but you might also be asking yourself, where the fuck do I start with this? Like, do I start with the gas? Do I start with the layout? Do I start with the electrics? And like, how, how do you get started in this thing? Well, my best bit of advice to you is just start anywhere but work on things incrementally and simultaneously don't go to a hundred percent completion on the layout and then figure out your electrics or figure out your gas or whatever maybe get a few bits of furniture and stuff dotted around figure out where you might want your bed and place it there and then run that against what you want to include with the water the gas and the electrics and make sure you can actually run wires and tubes and stuff to all the things you need and then once you've done that quickly reference the regulations to make sure that you're following them still you need to kind of work on things simultaneously again i'll reference the amount of models in my graveyard where i went to a hundred percent completion with something i got it perfect and I spent hours and days on some of these models and then would get to a point where it, like the gas wouldn't work out and it would just fundamentally undermine everything I had designed. It really, it, it's painful. It's painful to put that much work into something and then be like, I've got to let it go. I, I, I have to start literally from scratch. It, it is part of the process where the more planning you put in up front, the more effort it will save you later. I don't say it often, but I'm very grateful to past Matt for putting in all the effort up front to helping me, future Matt, in making my life easier. Normally, past Matt is an absolute dickhead. It's much better to draft and hash these things out while they're just pixels on a screen or scribbles on a piece of paper than it is when they're actual materials that you spent time and money getting and installing and then finding out they're wrong that way. Do as much planning up front as you can and it will save you a ton of effort later. Anyway, the uncut version of this, I've been talking for an hour and 15 minutes and so I think I'm gonna cut there because this is probably gonna be a long video. As always, thank you very much for watching. If you found this useful, please don't forget to leave a comment below. Subscribe if you haven't already. Check out the links in the description and grab, where the fuck did I put it? Grab the van conversion Bible. It will help you tremendously throughout this build and uh, check out the resources below. Thanks for watching.